And April 30th, sorry. <laughs> April 30th. <laughs> so um, I guess we can uh, start discussion with, um, I think, some uh, lead in, Tom or um, uh, George. Either, so either can, one of you could lead in start. with your budget. Uh, the School Finance Committee, I believe, has concluded its work, its <clears throat> review. I had the chance, uh, Ruth and I, to, to meet with the school administration yesterday and, and get a kind of a sneak peek. I know Kate was feverishly putting papers together, and uh, I, I guess on her behalf, uh, we apologize that it wasn't done in advance, but there are materials here tonight. And I might suggest the best thing to do, because this really is a school-focused conversation, I think, is to spend time to understand what's been done to date. Um, uh, once that's concluded, I do have a piece that I've put together that kind of takes all of that into account and gives us a sense of where we are. Uh, so I might suggest that be the best format. And um, Mr. Ash, everybody's asked to uh, speak directly to the mic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm talking to everybody. <laughs> Everybody at home doesn't need to know, <laughs> but right here, um, they ask that we speak directly into the mic. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Tom's got uh, some some packets of information that uh, Kate Bolton has put together, um, and if you want, we can we can uh, go through the first sheet of those when you when they come around. Great. Um, give you a couple seconds to. While they get their copies, just so you're aware, I, the one piece that I did have yesterday and I passed on was detailed information on the base expenditure piece. Uh, I'm not sure if that's part of this packet, but that was sent out to the council yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There may still be questions about that, but uh, they did have that piece in advance. Yeah, I thought we would just um, basically give you a quick walkthrough of the work that we've done to date. Uh, our process started um, several months ago. Um, but the, the real meat of it was wrapped up on uh, Monday, last Monday, where we went through the um, investment program restorations. So looking at this, the, uh, the first sheet you have in front of you, that looks like this with the pink column and the blue column. Uh, it's the Scarborough School Department budget proposals, FY 2015. The column on the left is, was the uh, first reading that you guys have, uh, that, was, that Tom had introduced to the council. Um, basically, the middle column is where we've made our, our, our adjustments in our review process. So in, in base change expenditures, we um, ferreted through several different line items and several different, several different um, uh, changes that we've had since the first reading. And we've come up with a $500,203 reduction in, in that line. In the investments and program restorations, we looked at the original 971.750 and were able to reduce that by 25% based on uh, some rather tough decision making from the, uh, the, the finance committee with the help of the leadership team. So that's a $235,000 reduction. In the adjustments to the operating budget, um, we were able to reduce that by 139479 and then uh, we, I was pleased to see tonight uh, we had a little bit of an adjustment in the debt service, which is, which is uh, nice to see. That was a $20,928 reduction. So uh, from the original first reading budget proposal, we've seen a, a uh, reduction, if you will, of $895,610. Um, we've also seen a slight increase in the non-property tax revenues. Um, basically, what we looked at is the, the state GPA formula was reduced. We got notification that was reduced um, by a, an additional $85,000 plus, uh, close to $86,000. We actually offset that on the finance side with uh, some of the undesignated surplus revenue. So we're ending up with a, a slight net adjustment on the property non-property tax revenue side of things. So we're looking at a an, inc an increase in non-property tax revenues of about $14,000. So for a grand total, um, we are looking at uh, the summary change in the tax request. So it goes from, um, it is a $909,806 reduction in our tax request. 
So um, the, the information you have behind that is some of the details. I think you've seen the, the um, was it the base, the base expenditure uh, piece already. Um, so this is more backing information for some of the details on what's on the first sheet. So um, I guess the long and the short, what I'd like to, to end with is, is uh, the process that we go through on the budget side, on the, on the school board side, is, is quite involved. Um, what you see before you is not uh, the first round, and it's certainly there are a lot of things that ended up on the cutting floor, which you, you won't see, and you, you, they don't, they're not displayed here. Um, but the process that we go through is very labor intensive, it's very um, complex, um, and it involves a lot of different people with a lot of expertise. So we're hoping that in the, in the end what you see before you is uh, a true representation of what the schools need, uh, in our opinion, and we're hoping that uh, with some explanation and answering some of your questions, you'll support us as we move forward. And what you see before you is what we're planning on presenting to the full school board at our meeting tomorrow for second reading and approval. So what you see before you is not official, not our official proposal yet. Uh, it still needs to be approved by the full school board. What you see is just the recommendations of the school finance committee. Chris, uh, sure. in the materials that you had provided to us a few days ago, you identified the anthem uh, increase uh, of 5% over fiscal year 2014, the first reading at <coughs> First reading at 9.5, so this was a go from 9.5 to 5 percent because you had better data. Right. Correct. We got the bill. We got, yeah. the, we got the bill from Anthem. And that and that resulted in a um, a reduction of 250 thousand. Two, 207, 207, 108, I believe. I know, and I'm looking at the materials that you had provided to us, uh, and it showed a change of 250,000. So my question was, am I just misreading this? Uh, which she, uh, you're looking at the base expenditure versus the finance committees. Yeah. It was the one that broke down uh, in pretty good detail mm -hmm. where what the sources of the changes were. Yeah, I'm... Kate uh, probably understands yeah, what I'm... I'm not sure exactly what the... The exact difference is here. This is a math question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you get 250. Uh, what we have was an original increase in our budget of 457, 724. If you're looking at that detail sheet, oh, so then the oh, new increase is 250. The difference so if you take being the 457 and subtract the 250. Right. There you get the two. Okay. Oh, the actual reduction. Thank you. So it's it's just the yeah. coming and going piece. Right. So Thank the you. actual the actual increase is 250. But it's a two hundred and seventy dollar reduction versus what we had in the first the the first uh, the other um, item that's a large item mm -hmm. in that uh, is the estimated effect of change in teacher insurance coverage of one hundred and seventy five thousand. Can you just give us a sense of what what that's which page are you looking at? Now? The, the second page yeah. of the handout yeah, that was given to us. And, and so you're looking at the you're looking at the blue, about middle of the of that table. Yeah, I was just looking for to understand the big ones. kind of grab it and pull it down. I feel terribly important. Mm -hmm. um, so you were looking at uh, the uh, change in the health insurance. What that represents is that in our new bargaining, bargaining agreement with the teachers union, there's a provision in that that says that if your spouse is eligible for insurance coverage elsewhere, that we're going to expect that spouse to go and take that insurance and not be covered on ours. Um, this is something that the, the school board negotiating committee worked out with the teachers union and um, with the idea of trying to reduce some of the burden of, of those benefit costs for us. What that number
number represents, the 175.704, is an estimate of what we think the savings might be in this first year. We don't know because we haven't gone through the process yet what we're actually going to receive savings. But based on the number of people who have their spouses currently covered, the percentage of those that we guess might be able to move them off somewhere else, uh, and then taking a, a sort of a, a conservative estimate as to what those savings might be. Okay, while you're here, the uh, reduced work, I'm, I'm looking at the other large item, the reduced workman comp per updated projection from Clark. We probably don't understand what that means. Um, we usually base our workers' comp estimate as to what it's going to cost us on, uh, well, work comp is, is actually calculated on your payroll. And uh, I think Tom spoke to this recently, your, your mod rate, which is your experience, the experience that the insurance company has had with you um, over the prior several years, and, and they, they blend those, those figures. Um, we were looking at a guess as to where we thought our increase would be based on our payroll and based on our experience. And in consultation with Clark Insurance, which is our, our brokers, we were able to sort of bring that down a little bit. They, they essentially told me that they thought that I had a little too much in there, that they didn't think it was going to go up that much. So we changed it by a percentage point and, and brought it down. And I, I really what I was trying to figure out was, are we talking about cuts or are we talking about just better understanding of what the numbers are as they were originally presented? I'd That's why I sort of looked at those three because each one reflects a better understanding of what the numbers are. They're not really cuts. No, absolutely. Okay. What, what they are are refinements made as the data changes exactly. and the information comes okay. to us. And, and I know we've all spoken to the fact that it's difficult to make those estimates totally. without the data in hand and that the, it's an ever-changing picture for us. Good. Thank you. Question: uh, your, The last line in the blue is refined natural gas projections. I'm trying to on, on which sheet? Constantly. The same sheet. Okay. okay. Yep. Sorry. I had noticed in the original budget, and I can't find it now. That there were significant increases in natural gas. Um, we have a new uh, contract under negotiation for natural gas this year, and the, the prices have been so volatile, we've been getting a lot of recommendations. Again, we use a broker, we use an um, energy service that advises us on kind of how best to settle those prices and, and helps us create those contracts. But the natural gas market has been so wacky that um, we have been trying to, to estimate conservatively. Um, Interestingly, we are hoping to save significantly in natural gas at the Wentworth School because of the new geothermal system, um, but that's offset with some increases in electricity, which it takes to power the system. So we're, we're not really sure where that's going to land us right now. But we do think that natural gas has definitely gone up since we had our locked-in rate, and, and we do think that's going to be a big jump for us. In fact, it's one of the things that we described as a, a key factor um, increasing our base expenditures in this base expenditure piece is that whole energy and utilities bit. And I, I believe, Kate, we can only do one-year contracts on natural gas, right? We can't do extended contracts? I don't believe we can at this right. point because the, the the people who are selling us the gas are just as confused as we are. They really don't want to lock themselves in because they don't know what's going to happen any more than we do. It's a, it's such, it's a global market. It's really not an issue of negotiation, in, in my opinion. Uh, you're at the mercy of the market, frankly. Uh, it's really understanding when to when to buy in the market, but when that price is, and doing your best to understand where it's likely to go in the future. So 
I know the school subscribes to the theory of locking it in typically for a year, uh, but there's great uncertainty certainly in natural gas right now. Well, then you can't call it a lock-in. Pardon? It's not a locked-in price. Uh, I don't believe they've locked in yet. I think that's part of the question. They're waiting. I thought you said it was, you had a lock-in price. We will lock in price, but we don't have it now. We're on a locked-in price now, but we need, we're uh, going to have to have a new contract. And we don't know where that new contract okay. will end up. Thank you. Does the municipal side, do we use natural gas or just the school? No, we do. This building uses natural gas. Are we under the same contract? Um, in the past two years, I have followed on the coattails. Todd Jepson, the uh, facilities director, uh, knows far more about those commodities than I do. So we collaborate, but I tend to follow his lead. Uh, they're buying uh, much greater volumes than we are, um, and I typically follow his lead. When I say that, it's really when we jump in and lock it in. So is it the same contract? Uh, we have a different contract. It's, it's typically with the same supplier, though. Why do we have a different contract? Uh, I believe that's the way they prefer it. Um, I guess I could look into that further. Uh, it really depends on the volumes that you're, you're purchasing, but uh, I can explore that further. Neither the school nor the town has walked in yet this year for next year. I was looking at the and making the adjustments based on the changes in blue that the level services budget uh, it looks like uh, it's about a million dollar increase for uh, salaries and benefits. I'm sorry, which sheet are you on, Councillor? I was just in the, general? The blue, the blue and okay. the salaries and benefits on the materials you sent us the other day. And because I was trying to figure out <coughs> what, what's the magnitude of the impact of keeping things as they are. And it looked to me like it was, uh, I guess, 75% of, it's a $32 million budget level services. Uh, the base expenditure portion. Uh, Salaries and benefits yeah. do form 76% of. And they form 76%. So. And the 32 million represents just the people. Because it, it it looked to me like it was a four to five percent increase, which I was thinking struck me as uh, you have contracts. But it's a it's a relatively unsustainable trajectory. If because the qu the question I would ask is, should the town expect that they would receive the same year in and year out increases in salaries and benefits? Well, I, I think that's why we're trying to do some of the structural changes that we've taken on. For example, the custodial services. We're looking at how we do that. in terms of the change in the contract, in the teacher's contract, which is our biggest contract, and really making some adjustments about eligibility for benefits um, and moving in that direction of, of controlling the, the cost there. there. There are efforts underway. Yeah, I, and I, I think if you look at the, at the, the backup information, that, that number is a culmination of several different contracts. That's the whole, that's the raw number, or right. the overall number. Um, it's further broken down a little bit on the um, base expenditure sheet that you got. You can see the in that green section at the top. This one. You can see where um, where we start to make some progress with some of the newer contracts, but there are still some contracts out there that we're obliged to to stay with. So yeah, I was wondering on the insurance piece. Do you when, when you have Anthem come along, is that a competitive bid or is that just a sole source? Yeah, that's Anthem, <laughs> Anthem is, a, is a thorn in our side. Yeah. We, actually, we, we love Anthem. What, what we have trouble with is that we are participating in what's called the MEA Benefits Trust, 
which is a, a purchasing group for insurance for teachers throughout the state of Maine. It's a huge organization and it has a lot of bargaining power. So the group rates that we get um, have been very competitive and the, the type of coverage that we get has been excellent. Um, the difficulty is that there is um, no free market because Anthem and the MEA Benefits Trust have controlled all of their loss data, and it hasn't been possible for an individual school district to go out with that information to get a bid to find out whether they could do better uh, with another carrier. Also, other carriers, until very recently, have been reluctant to come into Maine and look to that market just for that reason. Um, one other thing that's sort of a millstone is that I hope no one thinks I'm calling them personally a millstone, but we have retired teachers who are linked to the group. So we have a, a large group of retirees who are still covered under that group plan, and um, their loss ratios are a little bit higher because they're in an older group. And um, so that tends to make us a less uh, attractive group for your typical insurance company to want to come in and insure demographically. Um, all of that leads us to wanting to go out and get some bids and get some competition, but the competition just isn't really there yet because of the structure of the system. So there's probably a lot of towns that join with Scarborough and the MEA. Virtually every school district in the all state. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, to their credit, that does give them bargaining. But does that mean everybody has the same benefits package? Deductibles, co-pays? Yes, essentially. The same, same choices, same offers. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same offers. offers. Right. It depends on what each board chooses to choose. There are, other, there are other school districts that offer 95% and right. the employee is only paying 5%. So yeah. we're at, right. you know. When, when, you, when you make a, uh, an agreement with Anthem, do you have the ability under your contractual obligations to say, let's up the deductible? We don't really have that opportunity. We don't have the opportunity to craft the plan. Um, Anthem has introduced two new higher deductible plans, which we've been able to, to put out on the table to our teachers just this year, which is great, and hopefully that will shift everybody to a little bit, an opportunity for a lower premium. Um, but we don't have the power to craft our own policy, our own coverage package. When we buy in with the MEA, we have the opportunity, as, as uh, Christine said, to say to our various bargaining units, well, we'll pay 80% of your coverage or we'll pay 50% of your coverage or whatever. But the plans themselves are, are created by the benefits trust. And, I, and it's that, that in private industry, uh, if it's a and it was 9.5%. If you got a whopper like that, the immediate reaction is you'd share it with the the employer would pay for a portion of it, uh, and so the the benefit package would change, the shared responsibility would change, so as to allow the world to keep going on. I didn't. That's what I'm yeah, sort of unlike private industry. Some of the things we're they're not as we're not as nimble. There are contractual right. obligations that sometimes run three years or longer. Uh, the health trust has been notoriously slow to embrace some of these uh, what are becoming more and more popular the higher deductible plans. But I'm mm -hmm. pleased that they are making advances. I think this year. Yeah, this year the there are time. two new higher deductible plans. But even their version of a higher deductible plan is thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. Thousand, you know, it's, it's really it's right, very right. conservative. Right. Um, but it, what a, a number of districts are hoping will happen is as Anthem opens up and begins to understand what it is that we're looking for as consumers, um, that they will continue to create those plans. Uh, the alternative is for us to go out and try to bid with very little information and bringing our retiree group with us as Scarborough's individual group, which tends to kind of skew. Um, that those group rates and it, it doesn't make us a very exciting prospect for another insurer. But we do pick the plan offered that we'll pay 80% of. Correct. And if if the employee wants to buy up 
they have to pay 100% of that buy-up. Okay. So we do have a little control, yeah. not a lot of control. Thank yeah. you, thank you. So these increases, the 5% is the employer's share. There's an equal 5% being shared by the employee, if you will. They're, they're but sharing they're 20%. Right. Exactly. Well, the, the, I don't think the percent goes to 20, but no, the money out of their pocket. No, it's 80-20, though. Right. Yeah. 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 You pay 80, the, the employee right. pays 20. Right. Exactly. So they have to pay 5% more right. of their 20% right. share. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question on this. Uh, it's the detailed base expenditure sheet. Okay. The, the, the bottom line in green, the carry forward for new positions counted in FY14 columns, section B. Another math question. <laughs> um, for that one, I'll, I'll just ask that you take a look here at the big long sheet. And um, in the first column on the big long sheet, which is the current budget, the FY14 budget that we're, we're living in today. We've got a section that says investment program restoration, which in our new budget we've been talking about the you know, various proposals and the, and the positions uh, so forth. In FY14, that budget proposal included $292,500 in and so on this chart, the 292500 sits in investments and program restorations, and then in the FY15 level services budget, you'll see that line goes to zero because those folks aren't investments anymore. They're with us. They're part of our level services. So the uh, carry forward of the new positions moves up to the basic expenditure. So once you've added them last year, then you're you got them. That's exactly right. You don't hire them for a year. You right. Right. Correct. So now they're added on and become part of this year's. Correct. Yeah. So rather than carry across 292500 sort of artificially in new proposals, I'm putting the 292500 up into the base expenditures because those are pieces. Those are some benefits. So am I to, I just want to make sure I understand this right. So in this pink column on the large sheet that you're, you're talking about, Finance Committee's latest, the 736-750, those are new hires then? Those are outlined in the investments and restoration sheet here. Um, there, it amounts at this point to 10.59 FTPs, which is 10.59 new hires. And then there are a couple of things that aren't available, but they're all the same. Is this a sheet that came out in the today? Because mm -hmm. I don't have it. It's in the final one. It wasn't in mine. Yeah, he doesn't have one. No. Oh, yeah, I just, there it is. I just didn't unfold it. I was looking for a lot. The last page is folded up. Oh, yeah. 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 Was well, this in my mess? I might have had a collating issue. <laughs> no, no. Oh, no, I found it. It's G. Marie. <laughs> <laughs> I can make it look the same size. <laughs> budget, there's ten and a half new positions? Correct. In this latest version. Right. So, Kate, so last year, uh, the carry forward on new positions, is that about the number that you experienced last year? Was The 292-500? Yeah. It's exactly the new money that we got last year for people. Yeah. So, th but they would have gotten a raise or something. Well, but that's that's not part of the base expenditures. That's just moving them back up in here. It's it's a sort of an accounting problem to figure out where the 292500 belongs. You could just say when you're looking at that FY 2014 column that the 292500 just belongs up in that salary cap because they're here already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a way of showing that that portion of the salaries and benefits was a new piece 
last year. So really, if you, if you, if you wanted to be a little cleaner about it, you could take the 292-500 in the FY14 column, roll it up into 30, 30 million, and you would have the same picture okay. you have on here. On the new positions, is there any particular theme, or, or are you able, what, what are you achieving by this revised request? If you look across the, uh, the phases, uh, K2 uh, is a big focus on um, our um, focus across the um, earlier grades in English language arts and, and adjustments there in our curriculum and our um, uh, efforts. A jump start is um, basically uh, the investment of getting kids uh, ready. It's a summer program. It's a small investment. Pays big dividends. Um, writing and uh, core instruction carries through Wentworth, and um, and uh, so you see English language arts. Wentworth has been a big uh, investment for the community in terms of the structure itself and the technology that's in there. Uh, there's a technology in, in integrator then uh, included, so that we're making good use of the resources that have been invested in. There's a rebuilding um, of world language, as you can see, um, and basically uh, trying to do some rebuilding in some critical areas that were cut uh, years back, physical education, critical to kids' health, um, and art and music, which was trimmed. I think we um, you see that same uh, theme carrying into the high school with art and music. Um, the uh, guidance counselor, just because we have caseloads for our guidance counselors that really almost uh, prohibit um, counseling uh, because they're so large. Uh, athletics is really a, a safety issue uh, related uh, to the athletic trainer that you see um, with concussion um, and basically the level of um, intense labor that's involved in, in ensuring safety and, and uh, running the programs that we have. Special services, you just see some, and it's on the back, you just flip the sheet, it's right on the back. Um, these are mandated student services. You find, are you finding them? Yeah, no. Don't worry about it, we'll check. Okay. <laughs> I've had a long day today. Okay, so, now you're, <laughs> so now you're on the back, and it's under special services. Um, and when you say, when we look at point four or point two, we're talking about uh, just additional capacity that we're adding. Those are not full-time positions. They're pieces of positions that are required in order to meet the mandates uh, for the students that we receive. And someone had asked about the population. Um, the population continues to change, both in terms of not necessarily shrinking and, um, and uh, the students that we are receiving um, do have more and more complicated needs that require more services. Um, the DW is actually district-wide, uh, the professional growth and evaluation piece, um, although shrunk down uh, by half, uh, really supports our new teacher evaluation system, uh, technology investment, um, and again, that's across the district uh, with an application specialist. We have um, made investments um, in previous years into uh, software programs and, and basically um, uh, uh, learning supports uh, that are that are technically related that we've not been able to take full advantage of. Uh, that's the reason for that position. Student health and safety, again, the complexity of students continues to increase around health, uh, and as well the, um, um, the concussion changes in terms of what we know about concussions and follow-up in school and so on really drives a lot of that nursing need. Uh, we're, we're inadequately um, um, uh, staffed at this point. Uh, the long-term uh, subcompensation was an effort to just increase the compensation so that we could be uh, do a better job at, at attracting subs, and you see that came out. And the quick uh, curriculum quality assurance is really our quality assurance effort to ensure that um, we have uh, uh, we're giving teachers the materials and the supports that they're needed. Um, and part of those supports are um, a, a coaching model that we use, uh, which is uh, research has demonstrated to be the most effective way. 
to really improve practice, which basically um, improves student learning. That's just a quick look at those things. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about any specific one. I have one. Um, <coughs> the mandated student service. Um, are those mandates from the federal or the federal state? government? Which one, could, you were talking about positions, what is it? Campus Safety Ed Tech. Mm -hmm. That's, um, that is uh, specifically a, a campus monitor for the high school. The Safety purposes. So not, you wouldn't, how does that differ from like the responsibilities of the high school resource officer? Like what, what's the different duties? The resource officer, I don't believe, provides security. I think they're there as, a, as a, an instructional type of person. The, the, this ed tech person is, because of the, the building is basically it's monitored, but there's a lot of entryways, there's a lot of hallways. Um, the the um, administration or, or the, uh, the administration at the high school felt that there's a need to have somebody avail available other than a teacher to be able, uh, an intermittent teacher to be able to patrol those areas, make sure kids are where they are, to make sure that there's, the high school itself is secured and people aren't. It's currently being done by teachers who don't have a class right. going on, an, on, on at a, that time. On a revolving kind of basis. There's not a, a person dedicated just for that. So, so that's that, part of their duties, right? So-called duties of teachers? The, the, the having been a teacher, like you get study hall duty, you get hall duty, you get bathroom duty, you get all really fun things when you're a teacher. But yeah, at the high school I think it's a little bit different in terms of what their responsibilities are versus like an elementary type of situation. Um, but the way it was presented to, to the finance committee was this is a definite need in terms of safety of the campus and ensuring that, that adequate protocols are in place. So, we, uh, Just for every, every one of these items there is a, there's a, um, a very descriptive um, uh, uh, proposal that looks at the need for the um, for the position, um, or if it's a if it is a position, or the need for the investment, what we anticipate to be the benefits of that of making that investment, uh, looking at lower cost um, alternatives if there are some, and um, and uh, those are all available. And if you would like a copy of, for example, that one, we can provide that to you. Yeah, one of, one of the things we look at at finance is, you know, the list you see in front of you is obviously not everything that's come that, that it's, the, it's the apex of the pyramid, if you will. There's a lot of things behind this that didn't make it through this process. Um, we sat down and evaluated for each one of these line items, there is a sheet behind it that the local building leadership teams put together. Um, part of that criteria is um, which goal does it, does it address? Um, is it a, you know, is it a critical need? What's the critical ranking? Um, does it, um, what are the costs of not implementing it? Um, are there low cost alternatives? So wherever possible, what you see is if there were low cost alternatives that we were able to identify, we've been able to, to, to flesh some of those out. Um, what's left for full time FTEs really are the, the local administrators and leadership teams and, and senior leadership team's opinions of these are the critical things that we must have moving forward. So, so it's not like we got 14, the 14 FTEs were not the beginning. That was, that was probably three quarters of the way through the process. So then when we looked at those 14 FTEs, again, we, we recycle that process through again with a um, running through a critical checklist, you know, always cycling through the priorities and eventually what fleshes out is what you see in front of you. So if I understand correctly, you started with the original proposed budget, my proposed budget, with just over 14 FTEs, and through your finance committee review, you're now down to 10.59, right. five of which are in fact full-time employees. One, correct, that's correct. two, three, four, five, yes, that is correct. That is correct. There has been, just safety-wise, um, Following up on Jessica's uh, question, I think it's important to know that um, 
we have embarked as a, both a town and, and school organization um, and created a health safety and security advisory team. Um, we, have, uh, we have a number of folks from the town uh, uh, in responsible and leadership positions as well as from the school uh, working together in the areas of emergency preparedness, response, and training, uh, looking at uh, school um, safety, climate, and culture, um, looking as well at um, uh, facilities and technology as it relates to ensuring safety and um, health and wellness. And that's been a, that's, that's been a great uh, vehicle for having important discussions and conversations about needs, um, and I, I believe that uh, that particular um, monitor um, is consistent, the request for that monitor is consistent with um, the look at the high school and the emergency preparedness and response capacity that we have. Tom, did you say that the, the number is 10.5 FTEs? <coughs> did I hear that right? Yes. Uh, it's the number, it's the number that tracks on the, okay. on these, flips uh, over the investment to the Oh, yeah, okay. It's flip, the number that tracks to the right. Bottom. Okay. So what is essentially being proposed with this amended budget is add 10 and a half new full-time people. No. No. No, no, no not 10.5 so. FTEs yeah. is Correct. a full-time equivalent. It, it is full-time So it's actually 15 or 20 people, but they're, they're portions of... Five definite full timers. Right, I'm just saying it's yeah. ten and a half FTEs. Full time equivalent. That's right. correct. Right. right. Are we are we teaching more kids? Is 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 that? I mean, we reduced most of those are restorations. But they're but we're not actually we haven't actually expanded the scope of uh, uh, the kids who that we have to educate. Well, I, I think school. if you look at through, if you look at individually, like at the middle school, for example, okay. the one that we're reinstating a full-time language teacher to to that's going to directly impact the kids. That's something that's absolutely necessary to to get the program even not even back to where it was before, but to start that progress forward. That's that's been identified as a critical need in the group. Um, you look at the PE teacher; it's a 0.5 position. So basically, what that means is there are, I believe, there are. Is it two, one and, one and a half? So one person in ed tech now trying to cover the whole curriculum. We make that half-time person a full-time person now. So now we have two people covering that. So we're not hiring an additional person, even though that that's part of the FTE equivalent. Yeah. So I think to Tom's point, we definitely have five new positions that we're going to have to go out and get new bodies to fill. Right. And the other positions are going to be increases of people's capacity, if, if, if you will. So it's not, it's not like adding... Ten brand new full time positions. It's bringing half of them up to the full time well, level. They're, they're fractional. Yes, here fractional. Right. At right. this point, you're teaching where's, more. Where's the money coming from? I mean, you're increasing five people, but you're increasing three quarters of a million dollars. I mean, if somebody is already working and doing part of a job, and you're going to ask the person to do another part of a job, why do your salaries go up? Because they're <laughs> yeah. only being paid for part of the work that they're doing. Yeah, I don't quite understand that question. Half the time, if we were teaching more kids by right. increasing world languages yeah. and PE well, and art, yeah. we are taking yeah. kids out of study halls, yeah. providing them with PE, arts, art classes, and world language, so they are not sitting in study halls. Yeah, and, and that's what has happened through the cuts that we had over the years. More kids are sitting in study halls, so we're trying to give them the classes that that they need. There are currently some kids, from what I understood, there's currently some kids at the middle school who do not receive music or PE right. or right. art. There's no art of these. Along right. their right. time there because it's just, there's just not anybody to teach it. So they sit in a study hall right. instead. And, and to your point, Councillor Blaze, the, the, if there's a 0.5 FTE person, it doesn't mean that that person's spending their full time there and only getting paid half salary. If they're half time, they're half time. They're only spending a certain amount of time there. So we're not, we're not asking, we're not giving somebody who's there for eight hours doubling their pay. We're asking them to work additional time so we have to pay them the additional money. So they're like a part-time employee? Correct. Now that's being brought up to full. Correct. To do more yeah. Servicing twice as many kids. Right, so. right. You know, uh, 
one question I have to Brown, right? What, um, what was the increase in enrollment for last year? O um, overall, or? Yeah. Increase has, um, has been fairly static. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think, I, think um, I just looked at the number one, I mean, 3,151. Uh, 3, so we, we, we hover around between 31, 3,100 plus kids. Yeah. At this point, it's 3,152 or something. Yeah. Like but that. I'd like That's to point out. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd like to, I, I would like to point out, though, um, uh, bear in mind, and we keep coming back to this fact over and over again because it is pertinent to the discussion. We lost, when we lost the positions of, uh, in 2010, uh, the student population didn't change then either. So we've been running with a deficit of, of people, and this attempt right here is, it really was, from the, fi from the finance committee standpoint, it was more teaching aspects of it. We tried to cut more of the, the um, secondary people out as that we could, and we really wanted to keep in, in, in the spirit of direct contact with the kids, with the, the art, the music, the PE, that kind of stuff. There are mandates in there that we have to have, especially on the special services side. There isn't much we can do with that. That's where we're obligated to, to cover that stuff. So, so to your, to your, I, I think to your point, Mr. Sullivan, it's not, that, it's not that we've got an increased number of students and we need more people to cover what we're at. Our base level right now is, uh, is in, insufficient, basically. Now, yeah. the, here's another question for you. Yep. We, we, we spoke about this when we had our meeting yep. um, uh, amongst each other in the uh, manager's conference room. Um, a lot of people want, you know, like to know um, from the school um, when, we get, when are we going to get to a point where, the, okay, we're saying that the students have leveled off, when are these large um, increases going to level? Do you have a, an answer to that? I, to me, I, I think you have to put it into perspective of where you're starting from and where you're coming from, where you want to be. Um, the, you know, that's, that's, yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. Right. And I think, you know, um, personally, I, I would love to see us get to a, a level where we're at least investing the, the average per pupil costs on across the state, whatever the state is. We're certainly not there yet. Um, that's, a, in my mind, that's a long-term goal. We have a very clear, defined need with the positions that were lost in 2010. We're still trying to recover from those. So, and, and it's, it's, as we discussed, it's not necessarily a position for position. We lost in our teacher, we're putting our teacher back in. Um, but at some point, we need to bring those levels back up because what we're seeing certainly at the, at the upper grades, at the high schools, and at the, at the middle school levels, is we don't have sufficient capacity in order to get the kids the programs that they want and the programs that they need. So because of that, um, we're trying desperately as a, as a finance committee to keep the adjustments slow and incremental as much as we possibly can. Nobody wants to see giant increases up and down in cycles like that. We've seen that in the past. It's not effective. So we're really looking at trying to maintain that slow and steady progression to get back to that base level where we can be, where we can be, what's it going to take, three, five, seven years? I don't, it depends on what comes out of this room and what goes, what the voters will approve. Right. Well, I, that's a good way of putting the base level for the amount of students that you have. And a lot of taxpayers want to know when are we going to be there mm -hmm. so we don't see these uh, big increases. Certainly, trying to control it as best we can on the municipal side. Yep. I, I think the theme. But you know, we're going through the same thing. Right. You know, we we're behind. Yeah, sure. that. Right. But we're we're trying to get it so that people are, you know, uh, can get somewhat comfortable with their taxes. It's a very hard job to do. So the municipal side falls behind. But um, I think in some cases, when it comes <coughs> to education or you know, municipal. Needs um, sometimes education is going to take the forefront. So, uh, like I said, a lot of a lot of the taxpayers want to know when are we going to be caught up when we don't see these c continued, you know, large, uh, you know, increases in taxes. I, I think Richard, uh, yeah. the um, it's been it's been interesting for me to see the themes because this is basically a kind of a zero-based game that we we're playing here in terms of looking at student needs. 
um, it's, it was $1.6 million that was identified. It basically came into the first reading at 939000 It's now down to 700 something thousand. Um, but the themes that keep playing out are, are really around building um, adequate programs that unfortunately had the foundation, um, the foundation was allowed to crumble beneath them. For example, building a strong foreign language um, program. I'll just use that as one okay. example. Um, you know, I grew up in a, in a farm community and basically um, in my junior high had more access to foreign language learning uh, than uh, our, our kids currently do in our middle school. That's just not okay today. So when, in, when are we going to be done with foreign language? Well, when we have an adequate and appropriate um, foreign language program, the ES state is saying that in order to grant a proficiency-based diploma to kids, they have to be fluent in a second language. Well, no kid's going to get fluent in a second language given where we start, because we start them too late, and we basically don't have an adequate program to get them there. Um, what is that going to look like? Uh, it's, it's an investment for another couple of years because we, last year I think we tried to increase two or three positions. We ended up maybe with a half. Or, so it's, it's, a, it's a slow level of progress. We are making progress and I think for that we're appreciative. Um, at some point with a static population, you will, you will get the program in place that's needed. But clearly what was decimated was foreign language um, the arts, music, um, PE, uh, and, and we also need to keep pace as well in terms of the support for technology. Uh, the community has invested, for example, in the Wentworth School, um, and that's terrific, um, and we've, we've, we've got to make sure that we're making the best use of the tools that have been put in that school. So I think it is a restoration, it is a rebuilding, and I don't think that it's going to continue on that trajectory um, that we're, you know, that we're humming the same theme every year. Um, if we keep building and we do some, some incremental building, um, it, it, it will level off. Okay. I, I also would like to interject and, and just remind us all that as devastating as, as the reduction uh, from the state is to the town, the reduction to the school department has been enormous, <coughs> and, and it hasn't ceased. And with just the bills that have passed this year, for example, we get, what, 10, 10 cents on the dollar? Yes. So if, if we send one child to a virtual school, right. one child, we have to pay 90% of that tuition state pays 10%. So then on top of that, we have to pay the transportation cost if it's to Baxter School, for example. That hits us not only in Scarborough, but the state is putting in money for every one of those students. <coughs> and that's going to reduce the total GPA for the students we currently have. So that's going to be another reduction that we are going to be experiences, experiencing as we move forward. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing we can do about it. The preschool bill passed. Right. That means that two years? I think, it's I two. think in two years, Scarborough's going to have to provide education for four-year-olds. Yep. So that's already in the work. We already have two bills uh, that passed this year, one on suicide prevention in the schools that we've had to already start training for. The entire staff <coughs> needs to be trained on suicide prevention. Everybody. State's not paying any of that. Right. Including all the way down to a bus driver. <laughs> and a, ca and a cafeteria all worker. Employees. Every, yeah. every, every employee. All employees. So, it, you know, it is scary to sit here and talk about a school budget of level funding when it is impossible to level fund the budget. And I was here in 210 when we had to reduce all of those positions. And I commend you 
I commend this town and this Board of Education and the administration for trying to bring us back to where we were. And just because it cost $100 in 210 is now probably going to cost us, a, that same 100 is going to cost us $150 in, in 214.50. So, uh, you know, not only are we trying to play catch up again, it's going to cost us more. Well, and, and we're stuck on the town council side because of the tax shift that's occurred mm -hmm. from Augusta yeah. onto the town. Absolutely. So we're dealing with taxpayers whom I have met and we hear from and emails daily mm -hmm. that they can't afford to pay any more property tax. It's really killing them to pay these property taxes. And when you add on, you know, the circuit breaker got changed and, you know, on and on and on and on. But that being said, so at this point, as the people, all of us, around, well, most of us at the table who are elected by the people of this town of Scarborough, we need to be working really hard to find that balance. And yes, we can't, there are all sorts of things we need to be doing in the school department that would make sense. And there are things in the school department, the most important thing, as I've said over and over again, for school to do is to educate children, to get them ready so that they can be successful upon graduation, no matter what it is they, they, they want to do. So it's also incumbent upon the school department to be looking at their budget. And I think, I know this is where I was coming from, I understand that there are unfunded mandates. I definitely support, you know, programs that are directly related to academics. But I really, really want the school department to be looking at administrative costs, overhead, anything that's not directly related to that child and that teacher in the classroom. And I hear that from my constituents. Yeah, if, you you if I could realize we have the lowest per pupil administrative cost of any district in the state. Yeah. I, I think it's really important to, to, to bring things into perspective here too. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is this, there, there are two separate independent boards, right? There's the council, there's an independent school board that we're, our, we're tasked with developing an education that's, that's adequate and appropriate and meets federal and state guidelines, okay? There's one factor that we, keem, we seem to be forgetting here and that's ultimately we sitting at this table do not decide this budget. The, the, the people of Scarborough decide this budget. Right. So, you know, we, we all put a lot of energy and effort and, 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 and uh, heart and soul into the process that we do where we wouldn't be sitting here. But I think it really behooves us at some point to, to say, you know what, we've, we've, we're coming at it from, we've, we've got everything that we think we've gotten out of this. This is where we think, think we need to be. Now let's let the people of Scarborough decide. Let's let the citizens decide. And, and I, I think that's, that's where I struggle with is, is how much, how, how, much um, how much input do, do you all as a council really want to put into this process? And I'm not saying that, I mean, we've, we've heard everything you've said from the very beginning, from the baseline, no tax increases. That does register with us. We hear that. We respect that. And we, we take those things into account when we go through this process. But at some point, we do have to be looking at it from the different aspects of it. You have to hold the line on the, on the tax burden it increases. That's your primary focus. Our primary focus is the base education of the children. They can be aligned, and they should be aligned. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately, the sweet spot or finding the right alignment for that is up to the town's folks. And, and once we've done our process and we've, we've had our discussions and our, and our exchanges back and forth, and, and we've worked together, and, and what we put out there, it's not going to be perfect for everybody. It, it never is. There are going to be people who, ha who like parts of it and who don't like parts of it, and there are going to be people who will support it and people who will oppose it. That's why we have the public vote for it, because if it wasn't for the public vote, we would be able to sit around this table, have the negotiations, come forward with a budget, and then we would all deal with the consequences of that. Yeah. Good job. I just, sorry. I, I just, I had one thing, we were uh, talking about the unfunded mandates, um, mm -hmm. and that's one thing that I've been, I mean, I've been on it for quite a while now, I'm sick and tired of it, honestly. Um, if they want, so will we. If they want <laughs> stuff to pay for, yeah, stop exactly. shifting it onto the right. local taxes, yeah. and we're going to 
we're, um, we're going to try working on that to try to get some resolve from that because it is getting ridiculous. And um, the one thing with the uh, preschool, that's going to is it, that's going to be another unfunded mandate. Yeah. Shaping up that way. Yeah. I was told we were told personally by Senator Miller that it was not going to be, and I knew oh. all along it was going to be. And this is the problem that we have with Augusta. Well, they'll get. They do something else, and this is it. It costs us time, time, again. Richard, they'll pay for. Yeah. They'll pay the per pupil cost for the education. Just it, but it, it's at our, you know, at our subsidy. Yeah. But they're not. They will not pay for any expansion of facilities, and we yeah. don't have the facilities to accommodate yeah. them right at the present time. Right. My understanding uh, of the. K program was that the first year they were going to pay a portion, right. the next year they were going to pay less of the portion, mm -hmm. and the third year you're on your own. Right. Now, whether right. or not that changed in the end, <coughs> I don't know, but that was the way it was originally and, uh, when you the federal government. When you said that they paid for the per student cost for four-year-olds, did you mean at our rate? At our yes. rate. At our rate. So, so we get 10 rate. cents, so, so it's a 90%. Right. Un unfunded yeah. mandate. Correct. I mean, and I didn't. Correct. I mean, if because I I hear what you say about that we have an inordinate amount of time where kids are <laughs> sitting in study halls in our schools, uh, uh, but when I look at funding four-year-olds versus going to art class or PE, I got to tell you where I come out. <laughs> I mean that is that's a no brainer. Every educator knows that you got to educate them from zero to five before you get them in the school system. So that that to me and now it scares the Jesus out of me to think that this is coming right down the road. Yes, it is. And it, and so when I look at this, I'm now looking at it with darker glasses. <laughs> I, 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 think I mean that's the only way you can look at it because now you what you're doing is you're signing up for all this. And then the, right over the horizon in legislation that's been adopted is a huge unfunded mandate. But, but Councilor, Councilor Donovan, if I could, we, that doesn't alleviate us from our responsibilities that we have this year. No, right. I think right. yeah. yeah. I'm just saying yeah. it's law, right. it's right. coming, right. and, and right. it's part of the discussion. And it's an election I, year. I think, I, I think uh, all these discussions become certainly a lot easier and maybe even go away if, if, the, if the state agrees to do what they have legally are obligated to do, and that's fund 55% of the right. educational cost in the state. They are not doing that. They're not being accountable to that, and we're all, as local taxpayers, paying for that. There was mention made of the chart that we had seen previously. Could we have that updated? I know the last time we talked about it, it was – it didn't have the most recent year in it. Oh, the per pupil expenditure? Yes. Yeah. 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 Could we have that? I don't think we have the data from the state yet. Well, I don't need the data from the state because I know that the state average is an average, and so it's not going to go like this or like this. But it would show me where we really are in comparison to a state average that's a year behind. We, we could give you a... Um, it wouldn't be a full picture because we haven't finished 2014 yet. We're only finished the third quarter of the year. So those expenses are the expenses that you've actually had during the fiscal year. You still have to get May and June in, right? I'm not quite okay. there yet. So you get 10 months out of 12. You have a pretty good idea where you, you are. We could give you where we are today. We could give you the... Well, I would... I think... <coughs> I think you could probably give me what you think the 2014 average per pupil. Like. Yeah. I'll make a stab at it. We'll see how close I get. I just think that would be helpful. <laughs> Can we put a wager on it? If you're right, then we get it. <laughs> <laughs> Being new, I don't know. Did we ever did we ever peak in our enrollment, or are we still going up? Did we have a peak period? Yeah. So you can probably anticipate 
That's on the horizon. Yeah. Well, yeah. Those yeah. other just many, many other districts in Maine, just because of the demographics of Maine, are decreasing in population. Scarborough and other of these towns are um, either maintaining or increasing, like Scarborough, not big jumps, but it's, it is steadily um, adding more kids um, um, because of the in-migration. People find these coastal communities um, desirable. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, the difficulty we have as school board members is we're elected and voted locally, but our responsibility is from the state. That's where our authority comes from. And we are absolutely empathetic and cognizant of the tax burden. We all pay the taxes of this town, so every time we put a new proposal on, it's our tax bill too. But we have the distinct responsibility to keep the kids who are in the school right now in mind. We can't worry and say, well, we're not going to give them gym because we can't afford it. We have to give them gym. Kids who in 2010 were in fourth grade are now about to be freshmen in high school. Sometimes they have foreign language, sometimes they don't. They have been in study halls if they're not in band all the way through middle school. They're not getting art, and these are, they don't get do-overs. This is it. They get 12 years in the schools, and now the last four years, they have had a subpar education, and You're almost it's not that. Jackie's it's fault. <laughs> <laughs> they have had a subpar education in Scarborough, and we're trying to incrementally rebuild it in the face of getting the state burdens being shifted to us locally, in the face of increased um, needs of how you educate students. So our population may be stagnant. We may have lost 30 kids, but we may have gotten 30 kids with special needs who cost significantly more to educate. Scarborough does a really good job at that. Yeah. We are really popular with families with kids with special needs for good reason. I would do the same thing. I would go where I knew my kid was going to get the best services. Scarborough does a really excellent job with special service kids. We're it's, but we can't deny the kids who are in school right now. We can't say to them, better luck next year. Maybe when you're a freshman, you'll get all the things you're supposed to have. They don't get another chance. So it's, we're in a very incredibly difficult position because we are not blind and deaf to the economy. We know. But we're legally and morally obligated to provide an adequate education for the kids who are already in the school. So when are the big increases going to end? I don't know. When is Anthem going to stop giving us 10% increases every year? We don't know, but we still have to pay those bills and educate the kids we have. So it's, I, I don't know how we get out of it because we're not adding fluff to these budgets. It's, it's incredibly difficult to come up with a budget and look at it and say, well, still not good enough, but we're never going to even get this much. So it's, it's incredibly frustrating every single year. We, we have 3,200 3, or approximately 3,200 kids showing up every day. They have to be transported. They have to be fed. They have to be educated. They have to, their safety has to be taken into account and all of the additional mandates of training and requirements and things that go with that too. So it's, it's you know, there are, there are a lot of challenges with it. I, I think, um, I'll say in the year and a half that I've been here, the communication and the interaction with the council has been greatly Im improved. I, I think this is a very good, positive start. And I think um, it's dialogues like this that help us. At the end of the day, it's our town. It's not our municipal and our school. It's our town. It's our town. And we've got to decide collectively as leaders of the community the best way we can do that for everybody. And, and the only way we do that is collaboratively. And I think it's working. I think we just need to, we need to really get comfortable with each other and, and gain a little more trust with each other that we're doing, we all have the best interests of the town and have these kind of dialogues. Because you know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging for me to sit here and, and, and hear things out in the public of, we were told one thing and we did something completely different. You know, we, we, we did hear it. Um, we, we understand it, you know, we're, we, we, we can empathize with it as taxpayers, but we also, as 
to, to Kelly's point, we do have to approach it from an understanding of what our rules and responsibilities are. And that's why working with you guys, we find out the best compromise for the town and then let them decide. That, that's ultimately what our goal. I see our role as framing, out it, framing it out, getting as much of it in place as we can, and then let the people decide. And you know, they may come back and say, no, we don't like this, but they've spoken. And then we can react to, okay, then what, where do we go from here? You know? Yep. When we sat on Monday, it, it was painful to go through these positions here, these, to bring these down from the ten and a half to, uh, to the ten and a half. I mean, we look at each one of these, and they're so justifiable. When you when you talk to the principals and you understand what the issues are in those classrooms, and in creating schedules that has that has kids in classes that are productively working, not sitting in study halls. But I think over time, you know, um, particularly, uh, you know, I've lived in town here for th almost 35 years. And what I've seen is even in good times, even when things were great in the 90s, it was still time to cut back. Mm -hmm. And so we took away, we took away, we took away, we took away, and kept it down. And that's why Scarborough ends up being, you know, the lowest taxpayers in the whole coastline here, York to Brunswick. And what it means is some kids in our families, the oldest child may get to take a foreign language, makes it into the second year when he's in high school, ends the fourth year of high school being able to speak pretty well in language and, and it looks great for colleges. The next child comes along, doesn't have the same opportunity because it's take it, Take it away, give it a little, take it away, give it away. It, it never comes to a place where it levels off in terms of staffing our schools fully so that all the courses are provided for the kids. You know, I've been in seven school systems in, in three New England states, most of them here in the state of Maine. I see kids in these rural schools, they're taking foreign languages in, in kindergarten. They're speaking foreign languages by the time they reach sixth grade. It's amazing. They have the technology. They have, you know, what they need to really be productive in terms of um, technology for, for later on in their, in their future careers or as they head off to college. We don't have it here. I'm like, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm just, I can't believe that a town with this many people, you know, educated people who believe in, in education, and yet still we're not even, you, you want, I know you want the, the school system to reach a level where when have you had enough, when are we going to level off, not until we get back what, what we needed to begin with. It's, it's constant, you know, back and forth, and so we never reach that place where it, where it works out leveling off, but... You know, I'm hopeful that, that that is where we can get to, but. Yeah, and, and, and to us, it's also, I mean, I, I, I try and take as much of the rhetoric and, and emotion out of it as possible and try and stick to the facts and figures. And we've asked for a lot of data on the, on the school board side of performance. And it's, it's pretty clear you can track performance with funding. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, and the year you cut isn't where you're impacted. But you can see performances through test taking, through graduation rates, through any number of different variables. You can follow the, it's a sine curve, and the sine curve is offset by a year or two where the funding impacts the performance. And the goal, we talked about long-term goals, we want to flatten that curve out. We, you know, we, we'd like to see a nice, slow, steady grad love to be able to do COLA and stay chugging away at where we're at and have a, have a great system. You know, and, and none of us at, at, in the council, are, at, the, at, the, uh, at the school board, are advocating for being the highest spending per person. Nobody wants that because it doesn't equate to a higher education. But when you look at student-teacher ratios, the USA News uh, report that was out, we're the top 10 high school in, in Maine. That's, that's, that's nice. It's nice to hear. You start looking at the meat of that survey, it's, we have the highest the highest student-teacher ratio in all of Cumberland County. 
only two people in the state have a higher, according to that, that, that survey, have a higher student, teacher, uh, teach, uh, student to teacher ratio. We have a 15 to 1. State average is 12 to 1. Our graduation rates were, thir our, 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 I think it was college readiness rate, they determined was 32.9 percent. The other ones were 50, 58, Falmouth, Cape, the people we still compare ourselves to. So, you know, I'm not saying that that, I don't know the background of the study, but, you know, the, 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 the news flash and the buzzword is Scarborough is the top 10 high school in the state of Maine. Yes, we are. That's fantastic. That's a testament to what our teachers do with the limited resources and the, and the, and the effect that they have on education. But when you look at deeper into it, the gap between number 10 and even number 5 is huge. And that's really what we're trying to, that's really what our, our, we're trying to accomplish, is ge just getting us, you know, I, I've never met a person who says, I really, I'm struggling, I'm just, I'm happy to be the last. I want to be 10 out of 10 when I start something. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I know nobody in our town wants that. But how do we get to number five? We don't do it all at once. We don't do it all with large jumps and massive increases. We've got to, to, to systemically, slowly make structural changes that we talk about and move that, just to keep moving towards that goal. And we need your help to do that. Because it, 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 and ultimately, the real question, as you guys are weighing, is where's the, benef where's the real benefit? Is the benefit here or is it here? And as a, again, I think, that, I think the challenge to us is to say we, we put our best effort forward and we let the town decide where it wants to go. And then we deal with the consequences of it. If the budget doesn't pass, we go back to work and we start sharpening our pencils and we look at other things. You know, because I, 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 it's very difficult to quantify what you don't hear. And people tend, when they have issues and challenges, they speak up, and rightfully so, and they should, and they have every right to do that. And it, it's it's good feedback. Rarely, and I, I'll, I'll ask you guys, do you rail, do you get emails that say, "Hey, you guys are doing a great job." You know, I really support you guys. You know, I saw that meeting yesterday. It was awesome. You guys handled that really well. I don't get, I don't get emails. I mean, it, yeah, it, I, you know. But, the, but as, soon as, as soon as somebody has an issue, even if it's taking something out of context, you get flooded with a lot of requests for information and, and clarification, if you will. And that's, that's good. We're here for that. That's, those are positive things. But we've just, I think we've got to work collectively to get to that, to get to that middle ground somewhere. So we need your help to do that because ultimately you guys do have the authority to say, you know, it's this much. And then we as a, as a board have to decide, can we support that? Can we, can we work with that or can't we? Well, like we discussed uh, when we had a meeting, um, next year we'll try to do things differently and meet earlier. Try something else. Better timing. Yeah. Well, at uh, least we're talking. Yeah. Right. right. Absolutely. Yes, yep. I didn't <laughs> <say much> tonight, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> She's saving the best for last. I know okay. it. <laughs> so, um, I guess, does anybody have any questions on the council? Mm -hmm. Does any of the school board have any Good discussion. I I know. Anyone else? I, I just want just one, one point. I'll, I'll make it brief. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's great uh, to hear these um, school advocates, uh, and, you know, they've got strong voices, and you know, they're your community members. I'm just the guy hired to uh, to try to make things work better. The, the thing that we do know, um, as Chris said, where we've had deficits, we can track student performance going up and down. The good news is, where over these last couple of years we have made investments, mm -hmm. small though they may be. We are also seeing corresponding growth and positive gains. So uh, I think the community should be confident that um, the investments that we are making, the restorations that we are focused on, are the right ones and they're having a positive impact on our kids. And I think that that would speak to the reason why we have suddenly got into the limelight and we are in number 10 um, in terms of our high school. So I, I think that should be um, some confidence building for you all and, and for the community to know that. And it, it is. <laughs> it's just, a, as a council, it's a tough spot to be in mm. between, you know, um, the public mm -hmm. that, um, that's not getting raises and people are not getting 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good meeting with you.